back. As we continue our series this morning, we're going to look at a man who was unwilling to turn back. In Genesis chapter 15, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born into mine ho- in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto the Lord, I, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Dear me, Father, Lord, I ask you this morning that you will use me as a vessel. I pray, Lord, that you'll use me to preach your word and that, Lord, you'll be lifted up and that we will be drawn nigh unto you this morning. I pray, Lord, that you will not allow any distractions to distract us from the message you have for us this morning. I pray, Lord, that you will help me not to refrain from saying any words that you would have said this morning, but, Lord, help me not to add any words that you would not have said this morning. And, Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Story has it that J. Hudson Taylor, and some of you may be familiar with that name, he was a missionary of old who went to China. In fact, he was one of the early missionaries ever to go to China, and he began a mission board called the China Inland Mission. While filling out the application to, to really apply to use a bank, he, he wrote down this as his assets. They asked him, please list your assets. His assets was this, 10 pounds, which is the way they count money there in England, 10 pounds and the promises of God. This morning I want to preach to you on, the ti- on a sermon entitled, God's Promises in the Way, as we continue our series of Walking in the way. As we look here in the book of Genesis chapter 15 where we find our place this morning, last Sunday we preached on Genesis 14. In Genesis 14 we find Abraham went out, uh, I'm sorry, Abraham was where he was still placed from Genesis chapter 13. Uh, He was enjoying peace, he was enjoying prosperity as he was where God would have him be. But at the beginning of Genesis chapter 14 we find a story that if you don't slow down and read and and figure out what's going on there, if you read it quickly, you'll gloss over what just happened. This is what happened in Genesis chapter 14. There were four very powerful kings who ultimately subjected five less powerful kings. They were subjected to where ultimately it was like they would have to pay tribute, they'd have to give them their goods and services, and they did this for 12 years. Finally, after 12 years, the five kings had had enough of serving the four kings. And so they rebelled in the 13th year. For a year there was rebellion going on in the beginning of the 14th year. Chedorlaomer, who was the strongest of the four kings, and the other three kings came ultimately to do battle with the five kings. They were going to get what was owed to them. And sure enough, as the four kings traveled to go fight the five kings, they defeated many other kings or several other, other people, and as they got there, sure enough, they whipped the five kings. They and their people fled into the hills, some of them falling in the slime pits. Well, while the king of Sodom was, was hiding, they came, the four kings came and plundered of all the things, and they took with them Abram's nephew, Lot, and along with a lot of possessions, and they went off. One of the men escaped, came to Abram, and told Abram what had happened. Abram, with 318 trained servants, went and took care of business, got Lot back, and they came back. He met with Melchizedek, king of Salem, and he met with the king of Sodom, who was a wicked, uh, wicked king. And we find that even in the midst of victory, he was humble. And because God had gave him the victory, he paid a tithe to God, and he took the blessings of God, and he refused the blessings of God of the wicked king. Now, after these things, in verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. 
Can I say in introduction this morning, every step in our journey of walking in the way that the Lord would have us walk in is a journey. It's a journey of faith. It takes faith, and our faith is in the promises of God. Now, here in chapter 15, chapter 15 is a very pivotal point in the story of Abram. In fact, it's pivotal for a couple reasons. One, it's pivotal because it changes Abram's future of what he understood of his future, but most importantly, it begins to show us God's redemption plan for you and I. And as we look here this morning, I want us to see some things that God promised to Abram, but I also want to see uh, through these passages and through some other passages in the Bible what God too has for you and what God has for me. As we find here at the beginning of chapter 15, we find that God promises Abram some very specific things. In the first verse, we find here after these things, after dealing with going back and fighting and, and getting Lot back and getting his family back, after paying the tithe to Melchizedek and receiving the blessing of God and, and staying humble and refusing the spoils of the wicked uh, king, King Sodom, we find here God coming to Abram. In fact, in this passage is the first conversation we find between God and Abram. In the midst of this, we find that God specifically tells him in this vision to fear not. Can I say to you this morning, this isn't a new thing. As you study throughout the Bible, we find oftentimes when God appears through a vision or an angel appears, the first thing God says is to fear not. When God was speaking to Joshua in the book of Joshua, he tells him to fear not. And can I tell you this morning, God does not want you to be in a state of fear. And God does not want me to be in a state of fear. In fact, the Bible tells us, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Bible tells us, fear not, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God, he it is that doeth go with thee. Can I tell you this morning, if you're sitting here this morning and you have fear, I don't know what the fears may be from. Can I say the fears are not from God throughout His Word? He tells us to fear not. Can I say that if we just get in His way and walk in the path that He's given us, He will deliver us through? There may be times where it may seem difficult. There may be times when it may seem dark. But God does not want us to fear because you realize when we're walking in His way, there's nothing to fear because we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. And as we find here, God comes to Abram and tells him to fear not. And I believe one of the reasons he tells him to fear not is what is to follow as we begin to look at the promises of God. Number one, he says, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. God promises Abraham here his protection. Now understand, the fighting in those days was off, uh, quite a bit off from how fighting is today. Today, hand-to-hand -to -hand combat is more of a rarity. Today, you can have somebody sitting in Wyoming in a trailer with a remote control and they can fly a drone thousands of miles away and do all sorts of stuff. A lot of our fighting today with different countries and other countries the way they fight as well, you know, you've got rockets, you've got guns, you've got grenades. There's not a lot of hand-to-hand -hand type combat. Even close quarters combat, most of that is still done with some type of weapon that shoots a projectile like a bullet and so forth. But when you get in that type of battle, two things are highly prized other than your weapon. Your bulletproof vest and your helmet. Now in those days, they didn't have bullets. They didn't have AK-47s and they didn't have the 50 caliber sniper rifles that they could shoot almost a mile with. They didn't have those. In those days, their battle was mainly done with swords and spears. Now, as we think of spears, sometimes when we think of spears, we think of people who take a spear and they throw it. Do you know the problem when you're in battle if you throw your spear? You don't have a spear anymore. So the reality is most of the time when you fought with a spear, you would, you would actually literally be um, thrusting and, and then pulling it back so you could still have your weapon. Or you had a sword, and with a sword, of course, you don't throw a sword. You would swing those. One other type of warfare we find in the Bible that they would also use is, and you find this with uh, uh, Jonathan uh, firing the bow, you would have arrows. But even those, even though they're projected, they're not projected a huge distance because they lose their velocity. 
So a very valuable and prized piece of warfare was a shield. When you had your shield, though they were different sizes, you would have small shields. Those could be moved very easily. You had larger shields, and though they could not be moved as easily, they were larger, so you didn't have to move them as much. It was a very valuable and prized piece of protection. And as they fought, they would value and, and be prized with their shield. God is telling Abram here, I am thy shield. God says, listen, as you walk in my way, as you go the way in which I tell you, and we find that that's what Abram is doing in chapter 12. God tells him to go, and he goes as God directed. And God is saying to Abram, he's saying, listen, I am your shield. I am your protection. I will take care of you. Other people in the Bible realize this to be true, and that's why the psalmist said in Psalms 3 that he was his shield. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Because he realized God was with him, and he was his protector. As I said before, the shields were different sizes. And can I say this? God is big enough to take care of any problem that comes our way. And I'm thankful today that God is still there and He will still take care of us. This was a promise that God gave to Abram. This is a promise that, that God has given to many other people throughout the Bible. And this is a promise that God has for us as well. That He will take care of us. He's there with us. We find uh, in the book of Proverbs, we find there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And I'm thankful for that friend who is there to protect us. I've heard story of my, my dad tells about how he overheard his dad one time telling his older brother. Now, my dad's older brother was bigger, than, older than my dad, but also he was a, he was a big guy. And uh, he could take care of business when it came to fighting. My dad realized that a lot as they fought, and he got took care of several times growing up. But he heard my granddad tell his older brother, now Steve gets in any trouble. You take care of it. And you know what that did for my dad? It brought him great comfort. You know why? He knew there probably wasn't a boy in the school that could whip my Uncle Donnie. Because my Uncle Donnie was a big guy who knew how to fight. And it brought him comfort. He knew no matter what he got into, somebody can take care of the problems that I'll face. If somebody wants to come pick a fight with me, somebody can take care of it. Me growing up, I honestly still not. I'm not one of these guys that likes to fight. Most honestly, this is my opinion, I think it's on track with a lot of what the Bible says too. Most fights are useless. Most fights, only the only thing that it will accomplish is two people get more mad than they were before they started fighting. And most things aren't worth fighting for. There are some things that are worth fighting for. Most of them are. Have you ever noticed how silly some fights are? Boys will start fighting because one of them looked at one of them funny. You know, I realized this in my life. I have a problem. Uh, uh, well, I have lots of problems. But one of my problems that I have is that if I'm in serious thought, I may look mad. I learned this when I first started teaching. I had students raise their hand. Mr. Leathers, are you mad at us? No. They're working on an exercise that I gave them an assignment they're writing. And I'm up there and I'm thinking about something. No telling what I'm thinking about. And they go, then why do you look so mad? I don't know. I'm just thinking. And I learned that I have to pay attention to my facial expressions or else sometimes I can look really mad. And they're like, oh, no, he's going to give us tons of writing assignments. He's mad, you know. And, and, and I learned that. But oftentimes people will fight over stuff like that, little stuff. But one day I was at a, I was at a place and there was a boy and, and uh, it, was, it was kind of fighting time. He was a, he was a bully. And uh, though I was, I was never a little guy, I was his choice, and uh, we were somewhere, and I was in a room, and, and he was outside the room, and he said, uh, he goes, you ain't getting out of this room. Now, you tell a guy, any guy, they're not going to do something, guess what their main objective is? To do whatever it is you just said, and so I was coming out of that room. I never played football. I was built for football. I never played football, but I channeled my inner defensive linebacker and I took off and I went to go through that door well the boy was a smart boy 
About the time that I got to the door, he swings open the door. So now I've got all this force to go out this door, and there is no door. But something did meet me with force. It was his left hand right on my face. And though I was charging this way, I suddenly, my direction was changed this way. And I mean, I was boom, down. And uh, it hurt. I'll be the first one to tell you it hurt. And I'll be the first one to tell you I didn't get a single lick in. But I had a brother who came down the hill. Before I could even get up off the ground, he was down the hill. And my brother was small, but my brother was stout. And my brother knew how to take care of business. And then it was all taken care of. I tell you what, it was comforting me, to me to know that there, though there was somebody bigger than me, and the guy was bigger than me, though he was bigger than me, and it was for some reason his goal to mess with me, it was nice to know that somebody was coming that had my back. Can I say this? There's a devil out there that's bigger than you. And there's a devil out there that's bigger than me. I, I understand what some people are saying when they say it, but... but uh, uh, I, I, I'm careful with this thing of devil bring it on. The devil's bigger than I. And the devil can whip the soup out of me. I know that. But there's a friend that's thicker closer than a brother. See, my brother, I had to wait for him to come down the hill. I had to go through getting my lights knocked out. I had to walk around for a while with a shatter on my face. I'll never forget when I first saw my mom. She's like, oh, you know how she does. You know, you know how mamas do. You know, and oh, what happened? This is like three days later, you know, because I, I was gone somewhere. And, I, and sometimes guys can be dumb, okay? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I had a shiner on my face, you know, and she's like, oh, are you okay? Nope, I'm dying. <laughs> Moms are fun to mess with, too. And, uh, but, you know, I still had to walk around with a shiner on my face. I still had to walk around with the shame, and for a while it was shame. It's been too long now, now it's a story that I use, but for a while it was shame, you know, I got, got a big shiner and black eye and so forth. I had to wait for my brother to get there. But there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You don't have to wait on him because he's there. Can I say to you this morning, you don't have to fear because God promises for you and I, if we'll simply stay in his way, there's a protection there. Now, I want to point this out. You have to stay behind the shield. You know, a soldier can have the biggest, you know, I could have a shield here, and this wasn't uncommon in some type of warfare. I could have a shield here that was this high that I could pick up and it could cover me com almost completely except for my feet and my ankles. But if I put it down, I could see over it. I could have that large shield that was impenetrable. I could have that, and it'd do me no good if I'm not behind it. Can I say this? You need to be in the way. You see, too often, you know when we get hurt, when we get injured, when we get out of the way. We go and try to do our own thing, and we leave God behind, in a sense. God's still there. He's waiting for us to, to come back to Him. But the reality is this. We get out of the way, stay behind the shield, and you have no reason to fear. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How can we have power? My dad, the story I told you just a minute ago about hearing his, that his brother was going to be taking care of him, Hearing that, he said it brought to him some comfort, knowing that if anybody wanted to pick on him, he was there. He goes, but I could walk around school just a little bit taller and a little bit stronger, knowing that, hey, he's got my back. Can I say this? We shouldn't walk through life arrogantly, but we ought to be confident in our Christian walk, knowing that God is there, and he gives us that spirit, not of fear, but of power. Secondly, we find, as he talks to Abram, he says, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Not only did God offer to him the shield, but he offered to him a great reward. Can I say this? God offers a great reward. I want to point out here that he says to him, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a ton of English, just a little bit of English. If we were to break down this sentence, we find the subject is I, the verb is am, and we have a compound part. I am thy shield, and I am thy exceeding great reward. Now, take you back to your English days. The subject is I. The verb is am. 
am is a linking verb. Anytime you have a linking verb, following that is something called a predicate nominative, which is a noun that equals. It means I equal. You can take out the, the, the am and you can say I equal whatever that predicate nominative is. Okay? We'll just give you a sample sentence. I am the pastor. Okay? I equal pastor. We're the same thing, right? Okay? Now let's apply it here. God says, I am thy shield. I, referring to God, equals shield. I, referring to God, equals reward. God is our reward. Not just God gives us a reward, and He does. Oh, His, his blessings are abundant. His supply is great. In fact, His provisions are, are miraculous. The things that God gives to us and the things that God blesses us with and the over and above and beyond what He does for us. I think of the psalmist who says, My cup runneth over. You know what he's saying? He, he's saying, I've been given more than I can even handle. The psalmist also says, I have been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaking nor his seed begging for bread. See, God gives us an abundance. God gives us supplies and, and we're so thankful for the blessings that God gives us, the health that God gives us, the, what money we have that God gives us and the supplies that He gives us and, and the opportunities that He gives us. I think of the church that He gives us and, and all the blessings that He gives us. But our reward is Christ. Jesus Christ, God Himself, is our reward. And He's saying to Abram, listen, I am thy shield, I'll protect you, and I am thy reward. You have me, and can I say there's nothing greater that you and I can have than the presence of God himself. You know, sometimes people will call here and say, you know, what does your church have to offer? And I understand what they're saying. They're saying, you know, what all do you do? A lot of churches do a lot of different things. Some churches just have Sunday morning services. Some have three times a week. We have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. What all do you have to offer? What can I do? Some people want to know what can they do. Can I say this? Pastors always have something you can do. And if you're here this morning going, man, I want to do something, just come see me. I've got plenty to do that you can do and, and work. But oftentimes they're wondering, what do you have in addition to what's normal that you can do? What do you have for the kids? And so I explain, what do we have for the kids? We have Sunday school. We have junior church and so forth. And they go, what do you have for this and that and other? And I want to tell you this, and, and I don't know if I've ever said this publicly before, but one of the things I love about having teenagers in church, I'm talking about in the main service, is they're in church. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you why, a little bit of why, and, 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 and then I'll, I'll, I'll pull this into this. Adults the same way. Because if we're not careful, we get entertained a lot at church, and we don't get much Jesus. If we're not careful, the, the teens go to a separate room and they get hyped up with music and they get hyped up with games and they have a blast for 45 minutes to an hour and then we'll spend five minutes with Jesus. Can I say there's nothing greater that you can have than Jesus? One of the reasons I love having you teens, and we got a bunch of you here this morning, in the service is you know why? You get to see Jesus. You get to see what God has to say. You get to see the reward which is God through the preacher's word. A secondary thing that's nice about that is I like seeing families sitting together. I really do. I like to see families growing together in the word of God. And I want, I want this above all, and, and this is for adults, and this is for teenagers, this is for me. I don't want to be connected to anything greater than I'm connected to God. And God says to Abram, I am your reward. You may be blessed abundantly. And Abraham was blessed abundantly. Abraham had anything that he wanted physically that he wanted. He had 318 servants. Boy, many of us would just be pleased with one, right? And, and some of you teenagers out there going, what are you talking about? I am the servant. And uh, I was there too when I was a teenager. I thought, man, my parents don't need any servants. They got us three, you know, and, and so forth. But he had, he, had, he had abundance. But the greatest thing that Abram had was God. Can I say this? Oftentimes we get all hyped up about all these different things we have. We get all hyped up about, oh man, I've got this and I've got that. Technology. I, I like technology. I'm a technology fan. Uh, within, depending on how much you want to say technology, within just this little area right here, I've got a bunch of technology. I like technology. But can I say this? 
None of the technology that's made in the existence of the world is greater than God. I like, I, I like, I like vehicles. I've got three, technically, and I've got three vehicles, and, and I like vehicles, but can I say this? There's not a vehicle out there greater than the reward, which is God. I, I like all sorts of things. You fill in the blank. I like, I like food. I love food. When we leave here, I'm going to go eat some food, and I like food. There's no food greater. There's nothing greater than God, but yet we spend so much time talking about all these other things, and we forget the reward. We forget the, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. When that fancy car breaks down, God's still with you. When the technology doesn't work, when the internet at work goes down and you can't use them anyway, God's still there. When, when, when the bank account goes dry, God's still there. When the cupboards are empty, God's still there. And God says, I am your reward. And I wonder how many times he doesn't look at us and go, listen, you've got everything you need because you have me. God is our reward. And as we look at the promises of God, promise, God promises Abram here that he is his protection or his shield. He is his reward. If you've got God, you've got everything you need. And we may not always understand why God hasn't given us those things that we need yet, but it's because we don't need them yet. And that leads us to number three. God promises to Abram the seed, the promised seed. As we continue, verse 2, And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Now, after what God just said, most of us would be, and I hope you are, going, Phew, what else could I want? I have God as my protection. I have God as my reward. What else could I want? But Abram did. Abram said in verse 2, Lord, what will thou give me? And he goes on specifically saying, I'm childless. Now, to be without child today isn't as big of a, a thing as it was in Abram's day. In Abram's day, it had different connotations. It could be a sign of God's judgment. It could be a sign of, of wickedness. But in, in the case of Abram, it was an opportunity for God to show himself powerful. In fact, for those of you who know the story of Abram, you'll know later on when he's very old, he gets the promise seed. But here he just gets the promise. As we continue reading, we find that, And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Abram says, Listen, I don't have a child. And ultimately he's saying, Should I just, should I just give everything, adopt Eleazar, who's my servant, and give it to him? Because in those days, if you didn't have a child, you would basically adopt one of your servants as your own, and they would become an heir. But God says to him, no. The Lord, behold, the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. God says, no, 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 no. You're going to have an heir, but he's going to be your own son. And then we jump to verse number 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So he takes Abram, he takes him outside, and he says, Look, you look up and see the stars, and I can almost picture probably how it was a few nights ago, or maybe a week ago. We had a night that was so clear. It was abnormally clear for a winter night. I mean, it was just so, so clear in the stars. I mean, my, my dad, he... He knows all the stars, you know, and there's the seven sisters and the Big Dipper and all that. And, and uh, he's like, man, you can see them all tonight. Whew. I can imagine being Abram going out, God's taking him out, and seeing the beauty of the stars. It reminds me of a quick story of uh, Lone Ranger and Tonto. You know Lone Ranger and Tonto? Yes, Kimo Sabe. And, and uh, they went out, and they had set up their tent, and they tied silver, and I forget Tonto's horse's name, but uh, tied him over there to the tree, and they got in the tent for the camp out for the night and middle of the night Lone Ranger wakes up and he sees the stars and so he elbows Tonto and he says Tonto do you see the stars he goes yes he says what does that mean to you and he goes well as a meteorologist it means it's not going to rain he says as a Christian means God's pretty awesome. It's what he does and what he creates. And it's beautiful. He says, what does it mean to you, Kimo Sabe? He says, it means somebody stole our tent <laughs> in the middle of the night. 
So with Abram, God took him out, showed him the stars, and no doubt it was beautiful. You know, God does some beautiful things when it comes to creation. Beautiful night, stars are shining. It says, see the stars? You can't count them. That's how your, your seed shall be. That's how your, your heir shall be. Now you got to understand, to Abram, this didn't make sense. I don't even have one son. Now I'm going to have that many heirs. How, how is my seed going to expand to where there's so many if I don't even have one? But verse number 6 is the turning point. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, the rest of the story we know. Eventually, in Abram's haste and, 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 and a, lack, a moment of lack of wisdom, Ishmael was born to Hagar, but then Isaac, the promised child, was born to Sarah when they were very old, the Bible says. And through that line, we find our Savior, Jesus Christ, was born according to that line, the promised seed. Can I say this? God promised to us protection. God has promised to us that He would be our reward. And God has promised to us a Savior who would save us from our sins. Over in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 3, we'll turn there quickly. Galatians chapter 3, we find Paul writing here and he's writing about Abraham. In fact, he's writing about this experience that we're looking at this morning in Genesis chapter 15. Galatians chapter 3, beginning reading in verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, which is what we just read in, in uh, Genesis 15, 6. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. For Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto the seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. We find here, referencing back to Genesis chapter 15, Abraham, and a few things that Abraham put his faith in. Number one, we find that Abraham here believed the gospel. In verse 8, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. We find not only that, but we find as we continue that he believed in redemption, that Christ was able to redeem us, and that he, the last thing is that he learned that Abraham believed in Christ. And can I say, neither is there salvation in any other whereby men must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way. And Jesus saith to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So as we find in Genesis chapter 15, some promises God made. He made the promise of being his shield his protector. He made the promise of being his reward. And he made the promise here of the promised seed. Can I say this? God has made us some promises as well. But the difference all comes down to this. What is our response to what God has promised us? Abraham's response was found in Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Do you realize this? We are incapable of getting on our own righteousness. You see, the Bible says, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No matter how good our works are before people, no matter how great they are, the Bible says our righteousness, our righteousness is as filthy rags. 
compared to the holiness of God is disgusting. And only God can make a person righteous. And the way he, he made a way so that we could be righteous in the eyes of God is through that promised seed, Jesus Christ. And that's the way that, that he made it possible for you and I as Jesus Christ left the holy of holies of heaven and he descended down to earth and he put on the form of a servant. He put on man which he created and he lived a perfect life. And he went to an old rugged cross and he died on a cross there for you and I, paying the price for our sin. He was buried and for three days he lay in a borrowed tomb, but three days later he arose triumphant over death, hell and the grave. And he did that so when you and I could be righteous in the eyes of God. But still the question comes down to this. What's your response to that truth? Do you put your faith in Jesus Christ or do you cling to the things of man? I like how one of the hymns of faith describe it. He says, the author writes, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Oh, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground, all other ground is sinking sand. As we walk in the way, God has given us His promises. And, and can I say this Bible is filled with the promises of God. But what's our response? Do we believe? Or do we read it like we do fairy tales and set it off to the side? My daughter has lots of books. She likes books. And different times she'll come over to me. I'll be doing something and she'll come over. and, Daddy, book. So I'll stop whatever I'm doing. I'll get the book and I'll read the book for her. Mama Llama Red Pajama reads a story with his mama. And unfortunately, I've got many of them almost memorized. My wife has all of them almost memorized. But, and I'll read the story. Baby Llama, what a tizzy. Sometimes Mama's very busy. And that, that was her favorite for a long time. And I'll read her the story. And then we're going to store it and we toss it to the side. And it's a made up story. It has no really impact or change in my life or her life. It's just a story. This is much more than just a story. This is life changing. And whether or not, you know, we get all the way through and we believe that Mama Lama is talking on the phone or not makes no impact on eternity. But what we do with the promises of God does. So I ask you this morning, what will you do with the promises of God.